This month on Legend of the Force, we have the conclusion of the Dark Empire trilogy with Empire's End. Partway through the writing of Dark Empire 2, Tom Veitch had something of a falling out with Lucasfilm, leading to Empire's End ultimately being truncated to two issues, and Veitch leaving the Star Wars universe entirely. This may be part of the reason why Veitch returned to DC from Dark Horse at some point in the 90s to in 95 to write Superman at Earth's End, the sequel to his Commandy at Earth's End series. In the conclusion of Dark Empire 2, the Emperor unveiled his new weapon, the Galaxy Gun, a super weapon that could fire projectiles through hyperspace to anywhere in the galaxy. The Republic forces are now on the run, with the book opening with an attack from the Galaxy Gun on the Republic's main base, being thwarted by a defective fuse of the projectile, giving the Republic time to finish loading up and getting out of there. However, while victory could very easily be imminent, the Emperor's own time is numbered. His last generation of clones was less resistant to the ravages of the dark side on his body than his original body, and he is aging rapidly, and this is his final clone. Palpatine travels to the Sith crypt world of Korriban, and from the spirits of the ancient Sith, he learns that his only hope for survival would be to transfer his consciousness to the body of Anakin Solo, Han and Leia's infant son. Meanwhile, Han and Leia have taken Anakin to Onderon to hide him there. Palpatine, however, is tipped off through the Force and attempts to kidnap the child, using his more decrepit appearance to deceive the guards of the settlement where Anakin is being hidden. However, he fails to deceive the Jedi protecting Anakin, including Brand and Leia. The two manage to slay Palpatine. However, with Palpatine's last dying effort, he attempts to transfer his consciousness into young Anakin, only to be thwarted by the mortally wounded Brand, who takes Palpatine's spirit into himself, trapping him with the power of the light side. And through that power, he prevents Palpatine's spirit from escaping again with Brand as Brand dies, and at long last, the Emperor is finally slain forever. While this is going on, a group of New Republic commandos, led by Wedge, Lando, and Cam Solazar, and joined by R2-D2 and uh, Chewbacca, raid the Emperor's Imperial uh, Eclipse Star Destroyer, the Eclipse II, which is over Onderon and brought the Emperor there. They almost take control of the ship's engine room, but are forced out. However, before their withdrawal, R2 sets the ship to perform a hyperspace jump to the Galaxy Gun, which is preparing to fire an Onderon once Palpatine succeeds. The Eclipse 2 hits the Galaxy Gun side-on, destroying it, but not before causing it to fire prematurely into the Emperor Reborn's capital of Biss, destroying the planet. The Commandos take a win when they can get one, and pile back into the Falcon, which they use for this raid, and return to Onderon in triumph, with the power of the Emperor Empire broken once again. The Emperor's resources are still somewhat strained, hence, for example, the defensive effective fuses on some of the Galaxy Gun's projectiles. At the end of Empire's End, the planet Biss is completely destroyed by the Galaxy Gun.
for Emperor Palpatine, well, I'll just let the Wizard of Oz speak for this one. And she's not only dead, she's really most sincerely dead. Brand is also dead, although I'm going to be less revelatory in this one. R2-D2 proves that they are very much a player character, but because on cracking into the Eclipse 2's computer systems, they determine the best way to deal with the whole Galaxy Gun problem is to just throw the Eclipse 2 at it and see which breaks first. An epilogue reveals that in the middle of the celebration, following the yes for real this time final defeat of the Emperor, Fima Dapoda vanished and is rumored to have returned to Nar Shadda. Now, the ending of this book is obviously rushed. The earlier installments of the Dark Empire trilogy were about four issues long, sometimes a little longer, and there's clearly more story planned here, especially with the whole full-page text epilogue. But we get works, not perfect by any means, but it does what it intends to do. The story is engrossing, and it moves at a brisk rate by necessity due to the truncated length. Similarly, the way the Emperor, Emperor goes out feels appropriate. The idea that he becomes so dependent on the power of the dark side has consumed him so much that his body can't handle it anymore fits with the idea of the dark side very well, that it's fueled by ang hatred and anger, and those are consuming forces. You have that a fire, the flames of anger and hate have to be fed by something. Um, it's why demagogues who use hatred and anger to where the populace use a target to sustain their anger and hatred and sustain the movement. Otherwise, it will burn itself out. The people within the movement will burn themselves out and go on to other things. They have to have a target for which for the flames to consume and spread. And for Palpatine to channel the amount of power that he demonstrates that shows that he needs to demonstrate to retain his hold in the Empire, that probably takes a lot of hate, and it has to come from inside. And so it makes sense for this to be causing his clone bodies to be burning out so rapidly. Because again, these aren't, this isn't the body he was born in, it's the body, it's bodies that he's manu had manufactured in an attempt to obtain a, basically live forever. Looking back on Dark Empire as a whole, I don't mind the Emperor's obsession with superweapons. Star Wars is at its core. Flash Gordon with the serial numbers filed off and with less camp. It makes sense for the Emperor to be doing an escalating series of superweapons because that's what Ming the Merciless does. It's like straight up in the Dark Empire series, later on in Dark Empire 2 and in Empire's End, his out, his early outfits, when he's not wearing the hooded robe that we see him in in uh, Return of the Jedi again, he's wearing these outfits, these robes with these big flared collars that are, like, reminiscent from Ming the Merciless to such a degree that it's like he bought it from the goth collection of the same tailor that Ming shops at. So, having Palpatine resurrected? I'm fine with that. Like, if you've watched old Flash Gordon serials, even when it's not Ming the Merciless, it's actually Ming the Merciless. It, like, the middle act twist is, surprise, Ming the Merciless was behind the villain all along because that, well, that's how it rolls, and he's a, you can't keep a good villain down, necessarily. I appreciate that now, after Emperor's End, they kept Palpatine dead. But I get why they brought him back, and they came up, uh, they did this concept of Palpatine resurrected, and I get why Lucas approved it and greenlit it, because when he, like, as much as he conceived of Palpatine and was inspired by Nixon, there is also absolutely a degree of Ming the Merciless there, again, repeating myself, so I could see that resonating with him and what influenced him in creating the character. Now, the next work for Children of for um, Legends of the Forest we'll be looking at is Children of the Jedi as we return to novels with the start of the Callista series.
you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe, and also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks, also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.